G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Today we are going to be doing a video looking at uh, each team in the league going into season 2023 and uh, having a crack at coming up with a bit of a pass mark for them going into this season. So yeah, again, it's not really a prediction as such, but it's somewhat indicative of uh, my forecast for, for how they'll go this year. Now again, to clarify, obviously I just did a video earlier in the week uh, talking about the, the coaching pressure scale and um, just to clarify, this video is not about what each team needs to achieve in the year for their coach to not get sacked. Absolutely not. It's more just broadly, what will they be looking to achieve this year um, and what would be considered a failure season? So it's just kind of trying to find that threshold of what would be an okay to good year. So in this video, I will go through the 18 teams alphabetically and give a little bit of a snapshot of how they're looking going into season 2023 giving them a general pass mark and uh, perhaps a view on how they'll go this year. So if you've been watching a couple of my other earlier videos this uh, preseason, you'll know that we are now in partnership with Druzy's Athlete Academy, who is looking for new recruits to train up, uh, both from a physical and strength and conditioning standpoint, but also the mental benefits that come with that as well. For anyone that is interested in doing some sort of exercise program through Druzy's Academy, uh, I recommend you check out the link in the description of this video where you can submit a client form, and essentially what that is, is just outlining your goals, uh, any sports you play, your strengths and weaknesses in your mind, and Druzy can get back to you uh, with perhaps a recommended program of what might be suitable to your needs. And he does specific programs as well, tailored to your specific needs, if that is something you're interested in. So by all means, go to the link in the description and uh, just submit a client form. It's absolutely free. Anyway, let's crack into the content of this video. We'll start with the Adelaide Crows, who uh, last year finished 14th on the ladder with an eight win and 14 lost season. It's worth looking at their recruits and, and maybe some key players that they've lost before we start the analysis. Uh, for them, uh, other than a range of the listings, they brought in one big signing in Isaac Rankin and then took a couple of later picks. Michelani, uh, I think, was taken in the late first round in the end as well, but Rankin is probably the main big in. What's the pass mark for a side that's been rebuilding the last couple of years and has been improving linearly. Um, I would probably just say to generally continue that linear improvement. So they had eight wins last season. I'd say they probably need to match that again for it to be uh, somewhat of a successful season. Obviously, assessing these sides that are kind of rebuilding, it's less about wins and losses and, and how they play. But I'd, I'd say to achieve the same level again is probably a pass mark considering, you know, a couple of years ago, it looked pretty bleak at the Crows. And I think they've kind of done really well so far with the the talent that they have. So I think just building on the improvement that they showed last year, eight to 10 wins, that would be considered a successful season from my point of view. The Brisbane Lions now, obviously we're talking about a, uh, a much stronger side comparatively, a lot further along in the premiership window. They made the prelim last year and had 15 wins and seven losses. They were pretty busy in the off season. They landed Gunston, Dunkley, Ashcroft, and uh, Connor McKenna. And at the expense of some key players in Mitch Robinson retiring, Dan McStay joined Collingwood and then uh, less of a key player, Tom Berry, got traded to the Gold Coast Suns. So a lot coming in, a lot going out, probably more coming in, you'd have to say. In particular, Dunkley is uh, going to be entrenched as a top 10 player at the club. Gunston comes in as another forward target, and then, uh, you know, a day cost level talent comes in, I think. The reason I named him, I won't name all the draftees, but uh, obviously he could come in and make an impact because he was such a highly rated talent. So... Being a side that has been in contention the last couple of years, or at least on the outskirts of contention, I'd say a pass mark for them is probably a prelim final. So genuinely contending for a premiership. I think anything lower than that, you're not really contending. Uh, I've talked about in previous videos, they probably need to continue to win big finals to legitimize this side. Uh, so I'd say a pass mark for the Lions is a prelim. We could say, okay, we got close, but not close enough. But anything less than that with this group in the maturity and the talent that they've got, I would say it's a failure if they don't make a prelim. Next, we'll talk about Carlton, who finished agonizingly short of the finals race last year in ninth spot with 12 wins and 10 losses. And it was one of the last kicks of the season that would rule them out of uh, the 2022 finals. So what have they done in the offseason? They've recruited Blake Akers, uh, and uh, their first round pick was Oliver Hollands, who's a chance to come in and impact it, being as a fast outside player. And Akers proved to be a very handy midfielder for the Fremantle Dockers last season as well. I think with their upward trajectory and the stacked talent, you know, the individual talent they've got on list, it stacks up. And I'd say the minimum expectation has got to be finals. Um, I think they're capable of finishing higher than simply eighth. But nonetheless, I think that's probably the threshold for what's a good year and a bad year. They make finals, they've taken a step. If they miss finals, then they've, you know, clearly stagnated. So 
I think that one's a fairly clear one. Next, we have Collingwood, who had uh, an incredible season, jumping from 17th, the 2021 season. They have jumped into a prelim last year and had 16 wins and six losses, got really, really close to a grand final appearance as well. Their offseason was busy. They recruited heavy. They got Dan McStay, which uh, solves a structural issue as a key forward. Uh, Tom Mitchell comes in as a, as a midfielder, in what is already a strong midfield. Bobby Hill as a small forward, and Frampton, who I believe is probably going to be pegged as a key position defender. Defender. In terms of uh, their losses, Roughhead went, as well as Ollie Henry joined Geelong as well. What's a pass mark for them? This one's um, tricky because it's hard to assess a side that jumped up so dramatically, so I'm reluctant to put lofty expectations on them. Of course, they're, they're capable of winning the Premiership in uh, 2023, but I think considering the rapid improvement that they saw in a new coach, I think they've got a little bit of leeway in terms of where they actually finish. So I would say their pass mark is probably top six. If they finish sixth after last year, I'd say they could be relatively content with that. Every fan's going to have a different opinion on what's what would make them happy, but I'd say Failing to make the top six would probably be seen as a step back, whereas I think six is still just above that threshold, if that makes sense. Then we've got Essendon, who last year finished in the bottom four with seven wins and 15 losses. Obviously, this is seen as a failed season to some extent because Ben Rutten got the sack and got replaced with Brad Scott. In terms of their recruits, I uh, included Tipping Woody because he's more or less a recruit, didn't play last year, and he's rejoined and uh, a chance for round one, I believe. They also got a couple of fringe players in Setterfield, Wiedemann, and then drafted uh, Elijah Sardis in the top five again, who can probably play early and, and probably play a fair amount of games. Their losses include Hurley retiring, Devin Smith retiring, and Francis. So uh, I'd say not a lot out of that, perhaps with the exception of Tipping Woody, will influence where I'm going to rate them. I think they're going to be relying a lot on sort of organic growth from the young guns, and we know that they have a lot of young talent as well. As I said, Rutten getting sacked last year implies that their club, their board, believes that uh, they're not in a rebuild. They should be pushing for finals. Obviously, they made finals in 2021 and uh, finished in the bottom four. So that was unacceptable. And I'd say they need to get deep into the finals race um, in terms of trying to qualify for eighth. That's probably the pass mark for me. I think they can probably just narrowly miss finals and it would still be considered a relatively successful season. So if they finish ninth or tenth and it's a good top eight race, then that's probably a relatively successful first season for Brad Scott. If they fail to nudge into that category, that's probably a misfire, I would say. So that's the threshold for Essendon. They probably need to finish in the top 10 and generally be a chance to finish in the eight. Next, we have Fremantle, who finished fifth last year with 15 wins, six losses, and one draw. Again, a very active player in this offseason for some good reasons and some bad reasons too. They obviously brought in Luke Jackson, who was one of the biggest names to move clubs last year. Jay Gromira joined at the last minute, and Josh Corbett uh, comes from the Gold Coast Suns. This was all at the expense of David Mundy retiring. Blake Akers joined Carlton. Logue and Tucker went to North Melbourne. Lobb went to the Bulldogs and Meek joined Hawthorne. So that's a fair chunk of... None of those players in the outs I've listed are, you know, top 12 players in their side, but some of them are more important than others. And I would say structurally as well, Lob and Logue, that's a blow. Uh, but they do have a lot of talent to cover those positions as well. I'm not going to predict them to dip just because of those uh, players they've lost, but it does really offset the the ins of bringing in Jackson. I think that will be that will prove to be more of a long term recruit than necessarily impacting their expectations for this year. I would simply say that their pass mark for this year is finals. If they can back it up and play finals two years in a row, then that legitimizes. Uh, their jump up. I'm not saying that their jump up wasn't legitimate, but uh, when you see a team jump up rapidly, I think I'm reluctant to place big expectations on them necessarily backing it up in the second season. So consolidate that form, finish in the top eight, and I'd say that is a successful season for Fremantle. Missing finals would be a blow. Then you've got the reigning premiers, the Geelong Footy Club, who uh, obviously won the premiership last year, and they were again a big player in the off season. They got Jack Bowes, Tanner Bruin, Ollie Henry, and uh, got gifted pick eight, I think it was in the end, in Jai Clark uh, as part of that Bose deal. Their outs, uh, Joel Selwood retired, and they also had a couple of retirements in Higgins and Dalhouse as well. So a little bit lost. Certainly Joel Selwood is a, a club great, um, but what they've brought in for the value that they did, they've arguably improved their depth, um, which is scary when they've just won the premiership by 80 points or whatever it was. I'd say the pass mark is just flag contention. Again, you can't... I don't know if a pass mark should be, you know, premiership. You know, it arguably would be for Geelong, who's probably in the twilight of their premiership window. But 
if they're around the mark and make a prelim again, then you say, all right, it just wasn't our year. So that's the way I kind of rationalize it. They have to be a flag contender. If they fail to be a genuine contender, i.e. make the prelim, then, uh, then that's probably a failed season. Then we've got the Gold Coast Suns, and this is an interesting one. Last year, they finished 12th with 10 wins and 12 losses. Their recruits are uh, relatively low-key. they got Ben Long from St. Kilda, Tom Berry, uh, Connor Blakely, and Jed Anderson. They signed as uh, the list of free agents or supplemental players, uh, and, of course, drafted Bailey Humphrey with pick six in the draft. So some, some good value ins, um, sort of consolidating depth. Obviously, Humphrey's a bit more of a high-end prospect. They lost Rankin and Bose as well, though. So those are two best 22 players. In particular, Rankin, I think he would have been an important weapon for them um, going forward. But whatever, it's done. I'd say the pass mark is probably just linear improvement. So similar to Adelaide, more so with Gold Coast, I think there's probably going to be a focus on wins and losses as a genuine measure. But any improvement whatsoever would take Gold Coast to their best win-loss ratio ever. So if I'm not mistaken, last year's 10 wins and 2014's 10 wins, both times they finished 12th. Those were the two best seasons they've ever had. So if they get 11 wins, then that is their best ever season. You can't say that's not a pass. And I think slowly but surely should be the approach with Gold Coast. Maybe finals in 24 is the goal. And I'd say any degree of improvement, that's a pass mark. And any you know stagnation or, or regression in wins and losses would probably be seen as, um, as a bit of a misfire. Then we've got the Giants, and this one is a little tricky to assess because they are a bit of a basket case, uh, in my opinion, in terms of the adversity they've faced with their list management. They finished 16th last year with just six wins. Their recruits uh, was Toby Bedford from Melbourne, and they got pick one in Cadman, as well as a, a slew of uh, late first rounders, and I won't name them all because I don't think they're necessarily relevant to how I think they're going to go this year. In terms of who they lost, they lost Taranto, Hopper, Bobby Hill, and Tanner Brun, and that really compounds... All the players they've lost over the last few years, it's uh, it seems to be getting worse at the Giants. So I would say their pass mark is simply to avoid the spoon because I think they're a red hot chance for it. It's a bit of a crisis. They'll be looking more at um, at players coming in and showing talent and potential because they've got a, young, a lot of young gun players on the list uh, through you know all their high end picks and committing to you know committing to the club basically. Anyone who buys in and uh, shows a commitment to the new game plan under the new coach Kingsley, that's really what they're building on this year. And wins and losses are probably less important, but again, being in the Sydney market, they're gonna still wanna avoid the spoon, I think. So that's pretty much their pass mark. Just avoid the spoon. Hawthorne, again, this is probably the trickiest one to assess in this entire list for me. Last year, they finished 13th. They had eight wins. Their recruits uh, were some handy players in Carl Amon as a free agent, uh, Lloyd Meek and Cooper Stevens, a couple of fringe players from other clubs, and uh, drafted Cam McKenzie with a top 10 pick as well. Their exodus is large, but it was a f an unforced one. They, uh, Some of them were retirements, and some of them were sort of eased away to other clubs um, to finish their careers. So we're talking about Ben McAvoy, Liam Shields, Gunston, Mitchell, and O'Meara. So that is a huge chunk of not only experience, but established quality. And, you know, all those, well, most of those guys are playing some pretty handy football at this point of their career as well. So that is a lot going out, and it's a deliberate strategy. So it indicates the mindset of Hawthorne isn't to necessarily win games this year, which makes it incredibly hard to set a pass mark on them. I think it's a legitimate question. Are Hawthorne really, do they care about avoiding the spoon? Because I think there's a chance they're in it for the Harley Reid Cup this year. Um, who is, you know, looks like one of the best number one picks ever this far out from the draft. So this one is a bit of a cop-out. I don't really know how to set a expectation on them. Obviously, their real goal this year is getting games into younger players, them showing growth, and I don't think they care one bit about wins and losses. So that's what I would say their pass mark is, improvement in the youth. Um, I don't think they care about wins and losses this year. Forgive me if that is a very uneducated take, but that is certainly how it looks from the outside. There's a deliberate strategy to cut experience. That's what it suggests to me. Next, we've got Melbourne. Um, obviously won the premiership in 2021 and then backed it up by finishing second last year with 16 wins, although they did go out in straight sets as well. So an unfortunate end to the season for them. They recruited Grundy uh, and a couple of fringe players in Shackie and Hunter. They lost Luke Jackson, of course, Wiedemann, Bedford and Hunt as well. So a bit coming in, a bit going out. In terms of next year, I don't think they've lost too much. Jackson's obviously a longer term loss for them. But Grundy coming in uh, gives them a very formidable ruck duo. So long story short, if they haven't lost too much in terms of personnel, at least going into this year, at least for the purposes of this year, then I imagine their expectations are simply to compete for the flag again. So that would make, for me, the prelim 
a minimum expectation for them. You could probably even say get all the way to the grand finals. Probably They're probably in the same boat as Geelong. It's time to strike now. They've proven they can do it. They need to get back there again. So I'd say prelim, but you could probably let me know in the comments if you think it should just be premiership. From Richards to Rags, we now talk about North Melbourne, who last year finished uh, 18th with just two wins and 20 losses. And it was a very concerning season from a North Melbourne point of view. Again, another club that has changed coaches to indicate that uh, even for a rebuilding side last year was unacceptable. The recruits included Logan Tucker, so they got some mature um, depth, I guess, and all best 22 players, really, to improve their best 22 right now, which I think is important to help the development of others. Um, drafted at Sheasel and Wardlow at pick three and four, and those guys could play round one. Who knows? Certainly Sheasel, I think. In terms of their losses, um, they had a lot of delistings, but the main one they lost was Jason Horn Francis. Talked about that a lot on the channel. Regardless of losing uh, Horn Francis, I have decided that I think their pass mark is probably about five wins this season. I think Clarks is going to come in and uh, won't accept the pathetic performances of last year. And to be honest, I don't think we're going to see a North Melbourne side that is as bad as last year because they were playing way less than the sum of their parts. Their best 22 isn't great, but honestly, I still think they're capable of a lot more than what they showed last season. So two wins to five wins in the, a first year from Alistair Clarkson would be a very positive step. And it doesn't matter whether they get pick one or pick two if they win the wooden spoon. I think it's more about getting those extra wins because we could see a year where they could improve in wins and losses and still win the spoon because they surely it will get more competitive at the bottom. Then we've got Port Adelaide who last year finished 11th with 10 wins and 12 losses, although it's worth considering that the two previous years they finished first and second in those respective seasons. Their recruits were Junior Rioli and Jason Horn francis and they lost Robbie Gray through retirement, same as Stephen Motlop and Carl Amon joined the Hawthorne Footy Club. For me, another tough one to assess for a side that uh, was top two for a couple of years, a genuine contender, had a couple of home prelims, didn't make the grand final, uh, and then started the season so poorly last year and kind of got their groove back. They went 10-7 and seven after their first five losses last season, and uh, it's a contract year for Hinkley, so this one will be an interesting one to watch, like I talked about in my video earlier this week. I would say a fair pass mark for Port Adelaide would probably be top six. I don't think it would be sufficient to just simply make the finals. I think they'd need to be one of the top six teams and one of, certainly a home final. Uh, top four is probably a little bit too lofty. I think to say top four or bust is uh, is probably going a little bit far, but to be re returned to relevance and prove themselves as one of the better sides in the comp, that is a step in the right direction. Then we'll talk about Richmond, who last year finished seventh with 13 wins eight losses and one draw. They recruited Taranto and Hopper uh, at the expense of Caddy, Edwards and Lambert all retiring as well. So there's plenty coming in. Yes, those retirements are key as well, but I think it's clear that this side is loading up to continue to prolong their premiership cycle. And therefore, I would say that an expectation of top four minimum is fair. I think when you go all out in the trade period and recruit two, pretty damn good midfielders you're loading up for you know competing and i'd say top four is well and truly a fair enough expectation of richmond this year st kilda another tough one to peg because they finished 10th last year with 11 wins and that wasn't good enough to keep brett ratton i think arguably that was because ross lyon became available um, but either way they clearly not happy happy with uh, the way their list is performing compared to how mature it is and i guess their perception of the talent their recruits were uh, Zane Cordy and then drafted Filippo and uh, a couple of other picks as well. They lost Ryder and Hanbury, some veterans that were experienced. Jaron Geary as well also retired. And Ben Long, of course, joined the Gold Coast Suns. With the new coach, I think this one will be a tougher one because he's going to have time to settle. So I don't think he's going to necessarily be measured on wins and losses straight up, but they obviously can't fall too far. So I would just say simple improvement. I think they're not so young a list that they would accept a big fall back because we know we're going to rise up. I think they would need to improve on what was already there. So I'd say 11 wins is the minimum expectation, which probably puts that at about top 10 or top 11. So, sorry, they had 11 wins last year. So that means 12 wins is their new expectation. That would put them pretty close to the eight. So I think that's probably a pass mark. To finish the same part of the ladder, I think it's fair to suggest St Kilda would not be happy with that, and that would be uh, a bit of a fail, I guess. Then you've got the runners-up last year, Sydney, who uh, finished third, made the grand final, um, and obviously had a terrific season by all metrics, considering they are a young, up-and-coming side. They recruited Aaron Francis in the off-season, and they had one key uh, loss in Josh Kennedy retiring as well. Obviously, he was pretty old when he retired. 
I'd say the pass mark for them is simple. Compete for the flag again. Um, it's not ideal if they fall out of that top four. I think a prelim is a fair expectation considering the list talent. If they finish sixth, it's probably a bit of a misfire, but not the end of the world. But I'd say, you know, if you get that close to a, um, I'd say yeah, close to a premiership, they lost by 80 points, but they were still right there in the hunt, the second best team. I'd say they probably need to get close to that again. Specifically, I think they need to make the top four for it to be a satisfactory season. Then we have West Coast who uh, finished 17th last year with two wins and 20 losses. I've done a video on West Coast uh, earlier this week if you want to go check out my long drawn out thoughts about what to expect this year. However, the recruiting brought in J uh, Jaden Hunt and um, you know obviously drafted well. So invested heavily in the draft. There's a couple of key retirements in Kennedy and Redden. Uh, both of those guys were playing pretty handy footy uh, considering how old they are as well. And then Junior Rioli left the club as well. For me, again, as I say in my Eagles video, probably their expectation would be more about game style and youth exposure. I think that's probably where Simpson and the, the match community will get assessed more is how many games did we justifiably give players uh, that are young and up and coming? Did we overinvest in the senior players? That's probably more the metric, but I'd say avoiding the bottom six is probably my personal, personal uh, expectation, to be honest. If we fall back into the bottom six, then that's probably a bit dire. And I'm confident that we will avoid the bottom six, but I'll tell you why in my video earlier this week. Finally, the Western Bulldogs uh, last year finished eighth with 12 wins and 10 losses, which is a bit of a disappointing backup season to being runners-up the previous season. They uh, had a good couple of structural recruits. They got Jones as a key defender who you know, was a free agent from Carlton. Rory Lobb comes in uh, to shore up the forward line as another target, and their early pick was Buzzlinger as well, who I think is a chance to play some games. Uh, I think he has that capability. The players they lost, Josh Dunkley is really significant, um, and then a slew of uh, lesser important players in Cordy, Shaki, Hunter, and Stefan Martin also retired as well, which is worth noting. Long story short, what is their expectation? I think they're in their premiership window. I think probably top six is fair. Um, saying top four or bust, it's probably not unfair to suggest top four. I think certainly anything less than top six would be a, a failure. You could certainly argue that where they're at, they probably should be making the top four, but top six is probably my hedged bets kind of way of looking at it. I'd be interesting, interested to know your thoughts on that issue. I think fifth or six is just within that acceptable threshold where they're a little bit closer to relevance, but they can't just keep missing the top four indefinitely. Anyway, guys, that is my crack at the 18 teams and uh, giving my thoughts on what their, their preseason goal is, I guess, for this season and what would be considered an acceptable season by their standards. They've tried to get in their head, their fans' head, um, but everyone will have different opinions. This is arbitrary. It's subjective. Um, so let me know in the comments. Uh, I always enjoy reading some insight from clubs that I don't support. So thank you very much for watching, guys. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.